everybody. <clears throat> Sorry, you have to put up with me and then a few other things before we finally get to the movie. All right, so uh, I'm waiting on some helpful oh, batteries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, because I don't do this enough and I like wouldn't actually remember to bring batteries along. There's that. Okay, so I am doing this talk on beyond the basics of automated testing. Full disclaimer, y'all are the victims. This is the first time I've given this talk, so uh, if it's a bit of a train wreck, we'll figure it out. And the clicker's even working. Um, okay, so uh, if you take notes, great. Otherwise, I've got, uh, I'll be putting the deck up on speaker deck dot com slash Jim Holmes. Um, all my slides are up there, uh, <clears throat> except this deck, which I was still finishing uh, this morning, so it's not up there yet. So this talk, um, some of you may or may not have sat through some of my various UI automation talks before. Um, if so, and you've actually come back, thank you. <clears throat> um, this talk is meant to cover really pretty much all different types of automated tests. Um, and this is really about trying to help you head off some of the numerous things that I've shot myself in the foot on that people I work with have screwed up. The point is to try to keep your automated test suite, regardless of whether it's unit, integration, performance, security, UI, functional, whatever, running as smoothly as possible. Um, anybody here have an automated test suite that always runs perfectly all the time, no matter what? Yeah, nobody's. One person in the back raised their hand, liar. <laughs> so first thing I want to do is start off with a story. Um, are any of you familiar with Roy Osherov? Got a few hands going up. Um, so Osherov uh, used to be in the .NET world, he didn't do the rage quit and then go to Ruby, uh, but he's written some really awesome books, not only about developing in .NET, but just development period. One book of his that I'd highly recommend, regardless of the platform that you're writing code on, is his book, The Art of Unit Testing in .NET. Um, his topics there are all very pertinent, regardless of the platform that you're writing on, but what is most awesome is the preface that he writes in that book. Um, and if, if you've not read Osherobe's writings, he is very open kimono about his own failures. And the preface to that book is a story about how he got his team fired after six months of working for a client. Fired. And that's how he opens up. Why'd they get fired? Because six months into their project, they were spending 75% of every working day fixing broken automated tests. And they were spending 25% of it. Yeah, there's some waving hands. Oh, you're waving to him. I thought you had the same experience. Um, uh, they were spending 75% of the day fixing stuff versus delivering value. And when you're consistently missing deadlines and your customers getting angrier and angrier and angrier, they'll fire you. And that's exactly what happened. The problem that Osherov had with his team was they were brand new to TDD, and they get this big project, they have no experience in TDD, but they say, ah, we're gonna, we've talked about this, we're finally going to do it. We've got a greenfield project, we're going to do it 100% TDD from the start, and they didn't understand things about keeping your tests clean, about keeping your tests fast, about keeping as few as tests as possible to the point where in the space of six months, 75% of their day was fixing broken tests. Um, so automated testing is really cool, especially if you are working in the UI field because you like use some tools and you see browsers or UIs pop open and they go around and do neat things that you don't have to do, that's kind of cool. Um, but there's a very consistent pattern that I've seen on all types of automated testing. You start out, you've got really cool stuff going on, and then it starts to suck, and then finally you're like, screw it, we're not getting any value. Yeah, there's a lot of painful laughing out there, right? Um, 
So maybe you or someone that you know has a current state that's similar to that, right? Um, slow tests, regardless of even if it's UI tests, right? If you've got a lot of integration tests, um, that can take a long time to run. You gotta hit web services, you gotta hit the database, and then all of a sudden your test suite starts to um, really crash out. Brittle, something changes somewhere in the system that you think is unrelated, and all of a sudden you have a passel of red broken tests. Those tests are causing, uh, <coughs> excuse me, costing a lot of time to get fixed. And then there's always the very interesting problem of you have so many tests and they're so badly organized and so badly named that you have no idea what is tested anywhere in the system because you have no traceability, right? They're disorganized and you've got 17,000 tests. What is covering what? Does that sound a little familiar? Yeah, there's some painful nods back there. All of this builds up to something that is really horrible and that's a trust deficit. Those automated tests are there for some very, very good reasons. This first and foremost is we're looking for fast feedback loops. We want those tests, regardless of whether they're unit integration, UI, functional, whatever, we want to be able to run them. We want them to run quickly so that when, not if, we screw something up, we get that quick alert flag. <clears throat> those tests are also our safety net so that we have confidence that when we make changes, if we have an unintended consequence, that we'll have a safety net that will let us know, whoops, something broke, go back and try it again. Also the importance of the automated test suite is that it lets your testers test. So. I don't know what the mix in here. How many of you would call yourself developers in the room? Okay, vast majority. How many testers? It's okay, we're not alone. <laughs> PMs? A couple came to the theater thinking you were getting to Captain America and got stuck in a geek conference? <laughs> All right. So automation is not just so that your testers can test, but it frees them to do exploratory testing frees them to do other high value things versus going through those 3,942 manual test cases which were crappy value in the first place, but let's not go there. It's about getting trust back in the system and information up to the stakeholder about what the state of your system is. Look, we got all of these automated tests, they're all green, the testers are getting their jobs done. What do you think about the state of your system? Do you feel comfortable shipping? All right, so enough of the rant thing. Let's talk about some fixes after I get coffee. It said drinks at the end of the hall. There's no scotch. I'm pissed. <clears throat> so <laughs> after my talk, after my talk. So first and foremost, the best fix for any bad code, regardless of where it is in your overall code base, is thoughtful approaches to things. We need good coverage, but we have to make sure that we don't have bad coverage, meaning a lot of overlap. We don't want 30 unit tests, which have a 70% overlap, coupled with you know, another 10 system integration tests that are hitting web services down to the database that layer on top of that, and then eight UI tests that hit all of that as well. That's duplication, it's speed, uh, impact, it's technical debt, it's waste. So we need to understand how we can go about things so that we reduce that overlap and make it as lean and effective as possible. So it means we do need to understand the data flow and what's going on here. All right, so, um, I have a little diagram here uh, that is simulation of a time card app. So we've got a client piece of this, um, and it's over here. You know how it's the client piece? No, it's on the left. <laughs> so the idea is that somebody's got a UI, <clears throat> they put in their hours, 
Um, it'll flow through, there's a controller, there's some business logic where we do some validation, um, hits on the device for some local storage and then goes out to web service. And then it hits a server side. You know why that's a server? No, there's green between it. What kind of flow charts do you guys do? <laughs> so it hits a web service, there's some business logic, and then the idea is that we get an Excel and a PDF output, all right? So <clears throat> let's talk about how we might make sure we've got good coverage on this and how we would ensure that we've got a good end-to-end -end flow, test flow. So hopefully we're building some unit tests in on the pieces that make sense. We might have some integration tests that are checking across the service boundaries. You know, if I do something at the business logic layer, does whatever land appropriately in the local storage, and can I submit something out? All right, on the server side, we've got the same type of stuff there. We'd have maybe an integration test, um, some service tests, some unit tests, <clears throat> and then we end up with physical things on a file share somewhere. So <clears throat> let's talk about the importance of end-to-end -end testing. Time card is actually a big deal for a lot of reasons. So if you are in a company that has a unionized workforce and you screw up time cards, that's bad stuff. I mean, first off, you have people that aren't getting paid, and then secondly, you have the union people involved in that. That's ugly. So um, there are all kinds of test frameworks that will automate a mobile app. So how many of you think we should do something like use one of those things and hit from the mobile app from the UI all the way down, tie that into some code that is then working through the server side and looking at the file outputs. Would, would anybody work an end-to-end -end test like that? A few, okay. <clears throat> I've tried those things in the past. That's half of why I have a gray beard. The other half is my teenage daughter, and the third half is SharePoint. <clears throat> SharePoint may be more than half, yes. All right, so here's the thing. Just because you can automate stuff doesn't mean you need to. Testing is about covering risk, and it's about informing us of the state of our system. So, with, especially with automated testing, we want to focus on things that are going to change and things that are risky. Well, we've got good unit test coverage. We have some integration testing already, both on the client and the server side. Um, and those Excel and PDF, how many people write their own generators for Excel or PDF? Usually, it's a third-party library or a service. So after a few years of suffering through trying to automate these types of things, here's how I'd approach this. I wouldn't necessarily add any other automation, period. Because here's the deal. The amount of time it takes me to build that up and to try to make it run smoothly and to be able to cross from a device over to the server side with all of the asynchronous mess, and oh, by the way, the Excel and the PDF, um, they're third-party services. You know why they're third-party services? Because they're in blue. <clears throat> um, if they're third-party tools, I don't necessarily want to test them again, right? Somebody else tested them. So I'd leave my automation testing here, and I'd let my testers just do a few manual verifications or explore around to make sure that, yes, yay and verily, when I do things on the client side, I punch submit. Within 10 minutes, I've got my two file products. And then everything else that's risky in that system is already covered by the appropriate level of automated tests. Does that make sense? Just nod your heads, say yes. Captain America will start in a few more hours. <clears throat> so um, some people will look at building up a system and they say, we do everything TDD. Um, so we've got our unit test coverage, and we've got our integration tests, and we've got our functional tests. But the thing is that, um, so I'm a firm believer in TDD. 
firm believer. And, and regardless of whether it's TDD or BDD or ATD, DD or WTF, DD, right? Test first, some way. Um, writing your tests first leads to a much better system design, because I think test first is as much about system design as it is about good code. Um, you still can end up with a lot of overlap. So um, I've got a example demo that I've used for years around building up a payroll application. And if you can't see everything there, or if it's not in your language of preference, don't worry about it. Here's the point. There are three different tests here that are checking the output value of a payroll calculator. And if you look at those three tests, I wrote them all first, <clears throat> but there's a lot of duplication there. There's a lot of overlap about how things are going. And if I was not good about refactoring my test code base, this duplication would remain there. And now, if something about the API changes or the design changes, now I have to go back and do a lot of extra cleanup. So if you're not disciplined and thoughtful and you're just throwing down tests while you're building out an elegant design, you end up with a lot of cruft. That red-green refactor isn't just on the system side. That red-green refactor is on the test side as well. So we end up with a lot of cruft like this. Also, people will write in behavioral tests down at the unit level and then repeat those same behavioral tests at higher levels. So an example is my current client that I work with in Dearborn, Michigan, who is a global auto manufacturer whose name I can't mention because of NDA <laughs> Ford, um, <clears throat> we're working on this line of business application that they're using to forecast um, model builds out model build outs for future years. So we've got this many type of engines, we've got this many type of features inside, you know, there's the top of the line, middle of the line, this color, yada, yada. Um, it, so this is an extraordinarily important piece of functionality because if they get the percentages off, if the calculations are off, it affects not only what we're going to ship to every market around the globe, but it also impacts like how many wheels we're ordering, how many air conditioning units, how many scotch holders. Um, <clears throat> So it's a very important piece of their business because if the calculations are wrong, could literally be tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in the red or the black. So we need to make sure that's very well tested. So when I started working with a client, um, the UI on this was already built. And what does every large customer, when they have any kind of business application, what do they always rebuild? Excel. So this is a web-based Excel thing with a lot of calculations behind it. And being a large enterprise, <clears throat> they go out and of course find some obscure control manufacturer that makes complete crapware but has an enterprise license which must make it awesome to work with. So I'm the automation guy, Jim, you know a web driver here, we need 60 tests to validate these calculations. And I'm thinking, 60 tests, and this thing sucks worse than SharePoint. <clears throat> um, so I start to look at the calculations. It's like, wait a minute. All these calculations are custom behavior that we've written in JavaScript as part of the client side. Well, so do I want to test calculations in a WebDriver UI test, or do I want to test them at the lowest level possible? I want to test them in Jasmine or something. So I ask the two testers that I'm working with, um, hey, do you know what they have for unit test coverage? And I'd just gotten to this team and the whole communication thing was a little shaky. So the two testers like look at each other and they shrug their shoulders. I don't know, what's a unit test? So wait a minute, your developers are right over here. Let's turn around and have a talk with them. So it turns out that the developers actually on this calculations had 100% coverage with unit tests in Jasmine for all the JavaScript stuff. And I'm like, woohoo, I don't have to write 60 tests. Instead of me trying to validate the calculations there, 
The calculations are being validated at the appropriate level below. Does that make sense? So we also found out something because developers love happy path tests, right? I've been a developer, right? <clears throat> one plus one equals two, assert true ship. Now, putting on my tester hat, as a tester, I start to get concerned when I see multiple parameters interacting because that's actually where the most nasty bugs come from is when you have combinations of things. And so I said, developers, tell me, um, are you doing any multiple parameter tests? And now the developers look at each other and go, hmm, I don't know. So because of that conversation, we actually fleshed out a much better test matrix because they started adding in multiple parameter testing. Now, we did this TDD. They'd actually built out that grid testing TDD. They had 100% code coverage. They had some duplication, but more importantly, they were missing some of the most risky pieces of action because they weren't doing the multiple testing. TDD is wonderful, but you still have to be thoughtful about it, and you have to be careful about missing important areas. You have to be careful about um, piling up coverage on things. So there's another part, which is um, don't test stupid stuff. Well, don't test stupid stuff. That's kind of rude. Um, so <clears throat> there are things that it does not make sense to test. And if we think about parts of our system and we dig into are they third-party components, are they services provided by somebody else, there's a lot of things that we don't want to waste our time testing. Um, so let me ask you, how many of you have a system that generates emails as part of a notification chain? Okay. How many of you have automated tests around that mail notification? A test where you, uh, the question was define. It was a statement. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I want to make sure that that mail gets generated, so I'm going to take my actions, punch submit, and then I'm going to test to make sure that the mail was generated. How many of you, as part of that, open up Outlook Web or Gmail to check that email? Nobody's raising their hand because they sense I'm leading them into a trap. And I am. <laughs> um, don't test Gmail. Um, the point of checking that a mail gets generated is the important part there. The important part is not to go log on to Gmail with probably your personal credentials stored in version control. Um, you're tying yourself to do it dependency on Gmail when, not if, Google updates their frameworks or their UI, then that test breaks and it's breaking for the wrong reason. Rather, look to do something like grab any one of the SMTP mail syncs that just you activate it, you run your test, and instead of that mail going out to Gmail, the mail sync is in the middle, it grabs it, and then you can test there to make sure that your mail was generated. How many of you are using something like a third-party um, control from Angular or from a commercial company like Telerik or DevExpress or something else? Okay, good number of you. In that grid that I was mentioning, <clears throat> um, actually a different grid, we're pulling information back, displaying it on the grid, and the business user, one of, so they get this huge list of records back, and one of their most important actions in that particular workflow is to be able to sort and filter. So I think it's one of the Angular controls or something or other that the team threw on there. Um, turns out it works perfect. And then the, uh, one of our business analysts is saying, oh, we have to automate tests around this because it's a business critical function. It's like, well, what are we going to check? Well, you have to check that the sorting works and that the filtering works. Did we write anything around that? No, but it's the business user's most critical function for this workflow. 
I'm not going to automate that. Nothing changes. So we use that third-party control, drop it into our system. We need to check once that it works appropriately. If we update that tool, new version comes out, we'll check then to make sure that works. But we haven't customized anything on top of that. If there's nothing changing and it's a third-party service component tool, whatever, make sure it works the first time. Make sure it works after it changes, but then focus on how you interact with that thing rather than how it works. What's the best line of code you've ever written? The one I didn't write. It goes the same with tests. What's the best test I ever wrote? It's the one I realized I didn't have to write because it was unnecessary or it was covered somewhere else. So, oh, by the way, I should have said this 25 minutes ago, but I'm only on my eighth cup of coffee, so I'm still not awake. If you have questions or comments, um, shout them out, throw something at me. If you've got questions, write them on the back of a $20 bill and throw it down here. So make sure the third-party control has tests. Um, sure, if it's open source and you can see the tests, great. If it's a commercial product, you're likely not going to see. But the point is, right, you want to make sure that at least you're using quality tools. Um, I'm not saying just throw it on the page and um, poke around at it once or twice. Yeah, it loaded. Yeah, it sorted once. That's good enough. You want to explore around that and make sure that tool is doing what you need. Make sure that it meets your acceptance criteria. Thoughtful testing. Um, so, one of the next things that I see talented teams, talented developers, talented smart folks um, do time and time again is they take a very craftsmanship approach to the parts of code that are getting deployed to production. Want to make sure that they're well named, that they're very readable, that they are um, highly maintainable, and then it comes to the test code, and for some reason these smart, awesome people lose their brains. Test code is production code. It is production code. You have to treat it the same way. So the love and care that hopefully we're putting in on the system side, we have to take that same effort over on our test code. That means <clears throat> um, we write code that is meaningful, that is clear as to its intent. Um, a great conversation slash debate slash outright argument starter that I love is um, readability, performance, and correctness. Which one's more important? That was a question, sorry, that wasn't a statement. Yes, no. To me, it's readability. And since I'm having the talk, that's the right one. <laughs> so premature optimization, you know, unless you are doing something that is extraordinarily critical, optimization is far and away something that I don't concern myself with until it becomes a problem. Now, I don't mean that we ignore it, we think about architecture, yada, 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 but when we're looking at a block of code, I will take readability even over correctness. Why? So have any of you ever seen the C or Perl puzzles where they actually intentfully try to make something as illegible as possible? Perl's pretty illegible to start with, but if you can't read it, how in the world are you going to go back and fix it when it's wrong? So. <clears throat> Enough of that rant, let's come back to the craftsmanship stuff. Just like we treat our system code that is being deployed into production, the test code needs that same care because it is production code, it just doesn't land on your servers, or probably shouldn't. Go back and check that. So the solid principles. Um, now, by trade, I am not a developer. I haven't been a developer by trade for probably like 10 years. Um, 
So it's a uh, single responsibility principle and dry, and I can't ever remember what Ollie in the middle is. There's Liskov and I think inversion of something or other. As a tester, I tend to worry about two things in my test suite code, and that is single responsibility principle. A class or a method or a something should only have one reason to change. Um, spun a little differently for testers in the house, um, if you have something named something manager or something helper, that's a good sign you may be failing with single responsibility. So yes, I have my domain object manager, which lets me talk to the database and create new domain objects, and I can also write them to disk, and then I can do comparisons there, and I can do other things. We want things to have only one job. So it's very clear, oh, I need to change something, or I need to find something. Where do I go? Oh, I go to the one thing. How many of you are working with Cucumber or Specflow or something similar to that? Okay, quite a few, that's, that's nice. One of the um, biggest offenders that I've run across is the notion of step definitions. Now, if you're not working with Cucumber Specflow or something, um, quick little bit of background here. So you write an acceptance specification in straight text, and then you have a code file that's a shim that the tool, Cucumber, Specflow, whatever, will consume that text file, but it's text, it's not executable, despite how they like to say it's executable specifications. No, it's not. We need some code to actually run that. So this intermediate file here sort of takes these statements of, given I'm logged on and as an administrator, when I create a new user, then something else in the system should happen, right? So that's text, but we've got to turn that command those specifications into code. So a, spe a step definition or the similar metaphor with whatever tool set you're on is that intermediate step of, oh, here's what we really need to do. Well, step definitions, if you are not careful, can quickly get out of control. One of the best things you can do is focus on organizing those intermediary files by domain objects. And the problem that a lot of teams will fall into is rather than thinking about a domain or a concern, instead they'll look at workflow actions. So instead of nouns, it's about verbs. So instead, uh, you'll see things like copy something, edit something, um, cr uh, create new order, right? So there's a huge number of things here. And if you're seeing verbs in the names of those, that's a problem. Why is it a problem? Well, because when I need to do something like interact with a product catalog, which of those three or four or five files do I go to? I don't know. I just have to start looking through. Or, yeah, I think something got written about this, uh, this one method. I don't know where it is, so I'm just going to duplicate and add this in. I speak to this because of personal pain on more than one occasion. Most recently, last year. For those of you who know me, I actually used to live over in Dayton, Ohio. Um, <clears throat> I started up my job with that client up in Dearborn, um, started introducing them to Cucumber, started introducing them to automation. We started building up our suite of Cucumber tests. Um, I talked long and hard about this domain um, concept of, look, we need to organize these things so it'll be easier to maintain. So I'd spent six weeks straight with my team there. I thought I had to point them in the right direction. We had a coach, another coach that was available to help them. Um, and then last year, actually right at this time, I came and I spoke at Stir Trek. I went home, I packed up a 27-foot U-Haul, and I drove across country to Ashland, Oregon where I spent two weeks unpacking, said U-Haul, another week doing some off-site work. I came back a month later, and my team had been like rabid, crazed zombie cats and gone all over the place. And instead of having well-organized domain objects, in the space of four weeks, we had 28 different verb files. 
was actually kind of impressed that they screwed it up that badly that quickly. <laughs> so then it's a matter of bringing all of that back into something that's much clearer and much better organized. So if you hold, take those intermediary files and you organize them by a domain object, now you have no confusion, no question about what goes where or where to find something. If it acts upon, acts with, or works about that domain object, that's the place you go. That single responsibility principle is critical. Um, I think there, I don't think, I know there is a talk about domain contexts in the last time slot today. I know that because I'm going to go to it. So the same idea, so yes, I'm kind of focusing on spec flow, on behavior driven type things, right, a step definition, but you can take those same concepts across many different um, tool sets or approaches. Another place that often gets abused is page objects. Now this is specific to UI automation. Um, the idea is that a page object knows how to interact with the UI layer. So it knows how to find buttons. It knows how to click those buttons. It knows how to inject text into a text field. It knows how to um, find the mix rate total percentage, where that's located on the page so that you can grab that information out. The, with the idea of SRP, your page objects should know about the UI, but they shouldn't know anything else. The page objects shouldn't know about tests. You shouldn't ever see an assert down there. That's the responsibility of the test file. So, or the step definition. You've got your test behavior here, that intermediary files knows nothing about how to interact with the system or the page, instead it goes to the page object, and that thing knows how to handle it. Something else is that, now I realize this is tiny, and you guys can't see it, hopefully you can see at least that it is an Amazon user account page. And if you can't see that, just believe me, okay? So people will take a look at a page object and they'll think, oh, this is a URL, or oh, this is this one page in the single, this is one view in a single page application. And they'll decide that everything on that page belongs in one object. Well, if we look at a complex web page, that doesn't make sense if we think about that single responsibility principle, because there are many different things that are going on here. At the bottom of a page is a footer. And that footer is common across most of the pages that are served up from a site. The same thing about the header. And then even if you get into the middle part of that content, which is that green thing there, which surrounds a whole lot of really tiny, really blurry crap, <clears throat> there are other areas or domains, if you will, other concerns there that you can break out. So if you're working with a page object, it's not just that view on the, on the mobile app. It's not just that web page or that WPF view. WPF. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Break those things down. Okay, so I've nattered on about single responsibility principle. I think for your test code, that's one of the most important things that you can remember. And the other one is the don't repeat yourself principle dry. So this is about duplication. Um, <clears throat> how many of you are familiar with the dry principle? Good. For those of you you didn't raise your hands, wake up please. <clears throat> All right. Duplication is one of the worst offenders in trying to keep a code base, regardless of whether it's deployable code or test code, trying to keep that clean and maintainable. So I already showed you those tests from the payroll algorithm, right? Where there was already duplication there. Now with test code, um, even more so than system code, the importance of understanding the intent of what that test is 
is very critical. So there's an expression you may have heard, keep your system code dry and your tests moist. Now somebody actually had an acronym for moist, I have no idea what it is. In my view, it's okay to dial back on the anti-duplication on the dry a bit to ensure that your tests are very readable. So one good example of this is abstraction. And hopefully everybody knows the line, you know, there are very few problems that can't be solved by another uh, layer of abstraction. There are very few problems that aren't made worse by another layer of abstraction. Um, some years ago, I worked on a product where we had um, <clears throat> uh, a very interesting set of service tests. And we got all fired up about um, behaviors. And so if I was making a comment on a forum post that was part of a forum, that was part of a group, that was part of an organization, we had multiple inheritance um, where each one of those layers did specific things to set up the test environment for that particular layer. So if you start down at the bottom, um, it was uh, forum comment, behaves like forum post. So that's one layer of abstraction. And then we have forum post behaves like forum content, layer three of abstraction. And each one of these layers has their own setup um, and behaviors. Um, so then as we continue moving up, behaves like a forum, behaves like a platform, behaves like an organization. So we had like a seven layer inheritance structure. And so when a test would fail, it was a real pain in the butt to climb back up that abstraction layer and try to figure out which thing frickin' broke. So you can get a little carried away with that. Any questions yet, or is everybody starting to fall asleep because I've run out of jokes? Fire away. Yes. So the question was, I talked about treat test code like production code. Does that mean that you run your tests as part of a build in Jenkins, and if the test fails, uh, you break the build and everybody focuses on fixing the test? Yes. Absolutely. Those tests are that safety line, the, the sa safety line, safety net. Um, it indicates something is wrong, either the test itself is broken or something in the system broke. That's absolutely the best benefit there, right? So that, that build should not go any further up the chain. Stop there, fix it, check the fix in, make sure that fix gets everything green, and then go back to work. The answer? Um, so uh, the statement was he builds on a Windows box, uh, Jenkins is running on a Unix box, there are case sensitivity differences between those. Um, in my view then, you need to have some tests that isolate that sort of environmental difference. Um, it, it, so that's not an uncommon scenario, right? We'll have um, tests that we do in one environment as we move the system through different environment, environments, things change. Those deltas should be wrapped by tests that are appropriate for that environment that guarantee the basic system functionality, right? Maybe you do need case sensitivity on sorts. I don't know, maybe you don't, right? But in the appropriate environment, you have those checks that are validating those environmental specifics. And that's actually critical because um, if you don't do that, then it turns into this environmental mess of, oh, let's see, wait a minute, we're in QA, and we've got this one weird sort order, plus I've got these two services that aren't live, which are live in pre-production, but weren't live in the development, and, right? Um, 
if you read Jez, hum Jez Humble's Continuous Delivery book, I'd highly recommend it. They talk a lot about those environmental checks as appropriate for that. It was a great set of questions, thank you. Anybody else? Bring it on. I, sorry, that's a painful laugh. That's not an insulting laugh. Well, this, this is what we were doing is that we put in about 75 pounds of, of natural dry waste, probably about 20 bushels, and we put all those plastic in bins and they were the size of a, uh, you know, like a small truck, and we put it like that in bags or whatever, and then they were packaged and then... So, so the comment was, <laughs> and, and this was painful laugh because I've had this happen, you build your tests in a certain platform, certain version, they were in Java 7. Um, hashes for sorting happened a certain way, moved to Java 8, new platform, things changed, tests fail. So then they came up with some um, ways to adapt for that. Um, it, that's a good point. When you change environments, I encourage you maybe to go back and look at that and see if rather than having fixed defines there, if there's not another way to approach that. But um, this is why we have tests. So those tests may have failed expecting a certain sort order, but the bigger point there is your system behavior has changed as well. Bless you. And then those failing tests give you the chance to inspect your system behavior. Oh, we had something major change do we need to reapproach what's going on with the system or do we just need to update this test? Thoughtful decisions. So let's talk about test data. Um, those of you that are doing UI tests, stop me if you've heard or done this, don't stop me if you've heard or done this yourself. Oftentimes, people will use the UI itself to set up prerequisites. So if I need to create an order, um, maybe I use the UI to first create a new user that I can book the order against. So the problem with that is <clears throat> it's slow, it's brittle, and if things break, you're having unexpected situations there. So avoid using the test to set up its own data. Each test that you have should be independent of all other tests. Each test that you have should set up its own data that it needs for that particular test case. Um, the thing is, if you're relying on test ordering and one previous test fails, everything else is gonna fail for the wrong thing. If you hardwire in setup data, you're using the same exact test values every time, and maybe introducing some random bit would identify something that might be interesting to go look at. So one thing that I do find very useful is at least baseline data sets. Um, Sometimes, especially in complex data models, you can't just easily create all the data that you need on the fly. So baseline data sets are okay. You build something up, you use some production um, code, you clean it up, and that gives you at least a starting point to work with. By the way, those are assets, those baseline data sets, they're assets, so what should you be doing with them? Source control, absolutely. Get them in source control. More importantly, I think, a better step is to move toward developing custom APIs. Um, because those APIs are going to help you keep those tests granular, random, specific, right? So here's a specific example. Um, let's say that we've got a contact management system. So it's just a little grid app. You can put names, telephone numbers in it and we're writing an update test. So CRUD test, create, retrieve, update, delete. I wanna write an update check to make sure that if I pull one of those entries, change its values, persist it back, 
that it has indeed changed. Common stuff. So I'm going to use my test to first actually create the contact that I'm going to work with. Then I'll pull that up, then I'll update it, I'll persist it back and check that it updated. In that scenario, what happens if the create step fails because something's broken with the create? Everything else fails, right? So, <clears throat> ah, crap, the create test failed. All right, file the bug, go fix that, um, rerun the test, and the test is still failing because, oh, it turned out that actually the retrieve functionality is broken. Oops, we didn't find out about that until we'd fixed the first bug. So now, I go file a bug, fix the retrieve stuff, run the test again, the test fails because now it turns out that we have something wrong in the update. So it's taken me three loops to get to something that was actually broken about the specific test I had. Test ordering is dangerous, dangerous stuff. Um, there are a very, 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 very few scenarios where you do need to do something like that, but more generally, those are larger workflow tests. So when possible, write APIs to handle your setup and your teardown. So I write a little helper API where I can say contact new random contact. And then inside of the method there, I can use something like Faker. Uh, it, are folks familiar with Faker? Anybody heard of that? A few hands. No, oh, more than a few. For those of you that don't know Faker, there's Faker.net, there's Faker uh, for Java, um, for a number of other platforms. It is an awesome data generation library that will give you real looking randomized data. So I can get um, phone, random phone numbers from Germany. I can get zip codes or postal codes for the UK. I can get wacky combinations of business names, formal names, first name, last name. Uh, if you're using tools to build out random data for testing, please have a look at Faker. Um, you don't have to worry about building your own random stuff. It will handle it for you and moreover, it's of kind of like the right shape of things, right? So it's not just Z, 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 blah, blah. It's realistic-ish data. But by pushing these things to a, an API, we can quickly hit those things. So um, configuration is something that we can also do with uh, APIs. How do you test CAPTCHA? Don't. Use an API, turn it off in your system, run your tests, turn CAPTCHA back on. Same thing for mail, same thing for any number of other things. And if you start to build that out through those APIs, your tests are gonna be much more stable. <clears throat> then there is my biggest favorite problem, which is <clears throat> asynchronous actions. And by this, I don't just mean asynchronous on a web page or on a view but on a system. So how many of you work with something like this? Um, you've got a component which submits something to another component that batches or queues something up. There's a delay, it fires that off to another system. There's another delay, there's an overnight processing piece. There's some final business uh, process that stacks things up, sorts them, generates reports, and then everything gets uh, stored out in SharePoint, in which case you've got like a flaming rocket-powered outhouse. In case you haven't figured out, I really hate SharePoint. <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. If I'm trying to write a useful end-to-end -end test, I need, to in, I need to trigger the action, and then how long do I wait until SharePoint finishes burning down or the thing gets stored, right? So the SharePoint flippancy aside, that last block there might be um, a report lands on a file share, or um, my user orders are finally updated in the database. Are any of you working with long-running disconnected processes like this? Yeah. This stuff is hard. And I'm not going to try to convince you that it's this trivially easy by just throwing up some blocks here, but the important thing is that instead of just saying, wait 
30 minutes and go again, wait another 30 minutes and go again, trying to test for that piece laying out here, you have to do some engineering if this test is really that critical. And by engineering, I mean, let's take a look at what the signal of that action being completed is over here. Maybe it is a column in a database being updated. Maybe it is a file landing on the file system. If you build an API that you know you have, it's gonna take at least five minutes for that thing to complete, you have a pause for five minutes, and then you figure out a timeout loop of look for the thing to be complete, look for the thing to be complete. And that API is handling that polling for that asynchronous piece. And that API knows how to do that. Your test then can just go consume the API that you just wrote so that your test doesn't have to worry about that. So, it's not just that easy, right? It's not just adding something that is this easy, can I pull, can I pull, can I pull? Sometimes you actually have to work with that final system or the workflow. Maybe you can intercept the workflow um, or have it raise a semaphore or send an event back to something or use a temporary database table. Spend some time, step back, don't just ad hoc write in, oh, we're gonna wait an hour, or oh, I'm gonna wait until 8 a.m. tomorrow. Use that API to build those pieces out. The final part of those support APIs that are critical are oracles, and I don't mean the Oracle database, and I don't mean the guy that Gerard Butler had to climb up the hill in 300 to go talk to, rather, um, for those of you that are testers, you're probably familiar with this, or a heuristic. So let me go back to that update test that I was talking about. So on the UI, I pull up a record, I save, uh, I edit the record, I hit the update part, and then I check on the screen and see if that contact uh, updated on the grid. And I pass or fail the test there. Is that a good test? Is it a bad test? wake up. It's an okay test. What am I not doing? I'm not actually checking the database or the persistence layer. I check the UI to make sure it updated. Um, I'm sure you've never done this, but occasionally what would happen if we tried to save that to the database, the database was down, there was an exception, and we just swallowed that exception, updated the UI, then my UI is different from the database. Has that ever happened to you? I've done that, oops. An oracle or a heuristic means we actually go down to the persistence layer, check that there, that is the system or record of truth. Well, if I've got a support API, I don't have to worry about wiring up database connections in every test. Instead, support API, um, grab this user, give it back to me, and then I can do my comparison. All right, so we've talked about code coverage, we've talked about craftsmanship, we've talked about constructing good basic tests about using support APIs. The last thing to talk about are slow tests because speed matters. And how many of you have um, accepted or your automated test suites that are running something like this? Lots of hands. How many of you have automated suites that take more than 12 hours? How many of you have take more than 24 hours? Yeah, okay. So we can just parallelize and that'll take care of everything, right? So if I have a system that is not the best designed, the system, not my tests, I'm talking the system itself, <clears throat> then the next best thing I can do is get a bunch of those things. And if stuff still isn't running faster, then let's get even more things to run slowly together. Here's the thing, Parallel, parallelism, running your test concurrently <laughs> often masks other stuff, I haven't even had any scotch, um, masks other problems, fix the system 
first, there is an awesome video from a conference that I talked at last year in Sofia, Bulgaria, which, honest to God, it was a great conference. A fellow talked about bringing his test suite from three hours down to three minutes. Concurrency was the last thing he used when his test suite was running at five minutes. The first thing they went after was system performance. And they made huge gains. They got down to like 20 minutes before they even touched the test suite. I'd encourage you to watch this video uh, it, because A, it's really cool, but B, they took a very disciplined, thoughtful approach to how they worked through things. Okay, so takeaways for you from this talk. This is not takeaways from food, but um, automation is critical, but focus on your high value, high risk things. That means avoid overlapping coverage. Be thoughtful about where you're using your testing and what you don't need to test. Your test code is production code. You've got to treat it that way. Carefully manage your data Remember that tests should use unique data for each individual test. Build out some custom APIs because those APIs will let you do all of those other things very well and you'll get better testing as part of that. Thank you all very much. Um, if you're interested, I have a book on leadership. I wanna remind you that um, you don't have to take everything down, just remember slides at speakerdeck.com slash Jim Holmes. There's my contact info. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.